there's this real effort to preserve their language and to keep these things going. Uh, but it, it also seems like the pull to just kind of abandon it is still present in many of their day-to-day lives. Do you sense that that's going to increase as time goes on? Like, do you see that that's something that's happening? Or is there more of an effort now more than ever to preserve language and to preserve their community dynamics? I think, I mean, just speaking of the, the region I've been working in, the combination of the the work we've been doing and other colleagues in the in the anthropology and linguistics community in Brazil and abroad, that like on one side that has had a, a positive impact of people you know valuing more having this kind of consciousness building idea and also this kind of educational side of people going to this intercultural education and hearing from you know university professors there the ones that are training that also it's really important and having this intercultural education actually makes it to a degree like commodifies their culture a little mm-hmm. bit because like you're a school teacher from x uh community you're expected to go to that village or go to the some educational event or let's say a little conference or something you're expected to go as a representative of your community so then uh, you have pressure from your your relatives and either people from other indigenous communities to you know represent that community well their language their culture their knowledge their you know, stories and those type of things and so that actually gives people a bit of like a prestige incentive to learn these things, right? Like I remember right after a, call, a friend of mine from this community, the Oduin, who, who the children were raised not speaking the language, right? They heard the old people speaking it, but they were never spoken to in the language, or very rarely. Uh, he said that he, he, he went there and he felt like uh, ridiculed, you know? Mm-hmm. He was supposed to uh, say something in the language and didn't speak the language. So he didn't, you know, so he felt like almost his, his other indigenous colleagues kind of thought less of him bef- because of that, right? Uh, and so he came to me one day and was like, hey, hey, Josh, you know, Josue, they call me. Uh, you know, I, I felt, I don't, want, I don't want to feel that way. And he came up to me and was like, you know, before I always saw it was like a really nice thing to, to speak Portuguese well, blah, blah. But then when I went to sing, I felt bad for not speaking my language. And I don't want to feel like that anymore. Like, I want to... Mm. I want to do what I can. And I was like, well, that's good. Good thing your mom is one of the last, you know, five or six people who really speak the language well. And so I kind of helped them yeah, work it, with his mom to kind of how to kind of investigate that part of uh, her knowledge, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i all for people obviously doing that and wanting to uh, speak their language that their ancestors spoke, right? Yeah. And that their parents speak and so on. But it kind of turns into this token thing, right? It's like you become this token member of an indigenous community and, and there's a lot of things projected onto that, you know, and that seems to be, so I guess to me to get back to something I was pointing to earlier, which is this idea that just by the very act of trying to play the game Hmm. a little bit, there's all these costs that come with that. Sure. And it's just, it's just hard. It's just sort of, I mean, I don't want to, like, reduce it to just heartbreaking or whatever. It's complicated. But it's, like, you know, how do you, I don't know, just trying to imagine. Like, I just don't have to think about this in my day-to-day experiences, but just having to negotiate with this thing all the time. And it always seems like it always wants more from you. Yeah. You know, and it's always changing. Like, if you have the, a, a regime or a presidency like uh, Lula or Duma, and then you have Bolsonaro come in a little later, I mean, the, the game changes a little bit. Yeah. And they have to constantly, like, well, now what do we have to do to, to exist at yeah. all, you know, in, in any form? It's just, it's kind of... So I would think, uh, like, yeah. maybe a more accessible parallel to someone from your background would be, like, uh, you said there are a lot of like Mennonites and Hutterites and stuff in in the northern Rocky Mountain West, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so like, imagine being in one of these communities, uh, but your grandma speaks the old language, right? She speaks uh, Plat Deutsch. She speaks Lower Lower Dutch or Lower German because mm-hmm. uh, she's you know from one of these communities. But you're a grandson, and so maybe you heard your grandma speaking it, but she never spoke to you in that language. Right. Right. And you see that your life is good because you speak English to everybody. Like, what's your incentive to learn? Right. Yeah. So it's like it's a it's a pretty similar situation, right? It's like yeah. it's how inward looking they are versus how outward they're looking, and then like what benefit they can see for themselves and for for community. Well, do you see something about the the complexity of identity, right? Because oh they boy. they're <laughs> yeah, I know it's a big thing, <laughs> but we could just say this a little talk a bit about this, which is like, if you identify as a member of this community, as this indigenous community, you speak this language, you are sure. of these people, you have these stories, 
whatever, mm-hmm. you know, you are this person. And then you do see the, uh, maybe there isn't really any actual immediate or even long-term benefit to preserving that culture or that identity. I mean, that's just got to be like, I mean, how do you, do people that you interact with in these communities, do they have this mm-hmm. question, you know, about what it means to be who they are? Or yeah, do they feel like, or is that not an issue that comes up for them? No, I think it is. I think it's something that they're constantly working on. They're something they're constantly they're constantly mediating, right, and and discussing. Yeah. So, I mean, I I think people look look at these things, and especially I think people value the language and the culture, and all these things. Just sometimes they have different priorities, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, just just complicated. It is. It's really difficult. Uh, and you can't speak for them, but you've, you've of course you've had yeah. a lot of access to their inner life and their world. So sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I don't know. Like I, I mean, the language obviously plays a big big role in their identity as indigenous people, right? And I think that's the kind of the story I told about my my friend who went to uh, the like a a workshop and then was kind of ridiculed for not speaking his language was one of these kind of informal pressures going the other way, right? It's not, sure. I mean, there's pressures, there's different, you're hearing different things whispered in your ear by, by culture all the time, right? And from different people and different actors, and there are all these kind of conflicting messages, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's, all, it's always going to be like that, and it's just kind of these little choices that people make to, you know, to... Oh, jeez, I don't even know how to, how to, how to say it. It's yeah. okay, I, I just, I think that that your inability to maybe even comp to talk about it is part of the thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, how it's do you talk about this? This yeah. is like a big, and me particularly being such an outsider, you know, I'm, I can only like have thoughts yeah, you know, sure. about it yeah. and ask questions. Yeah. That's hard. The identity language. It's, it's cause I think that's the thing about language, right? Is there's, it's, it's attached to everything. It's not one thing. When you study language, you're not just studying words. I mean, you can, but you seem to approach it from much more like sure. comprehensive, Absolutely. integrated way, right? Yeah. It's tied to the culture. It's tied to everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when it's lost, you're losing a lot more than just words. Absolutely. It, so language is much more than just a collection of words, right? It's more than a collection of words. It's more than a collection of phrasing. It's a way of thinking, a way of interpreting things, a way of expressing yourself, a way of like making sense of the world around you, right? So it really, when you lose the language, it's not that parts of the culture can't be propagated, that they can't be transmitted, because they absolutely can. It's just that, like, a language is such a, uh, a nice cognitive lens to see all these things through, your stories, mm-hmm. uh, your food, your relationships uh, within your community, outside your community, that when it's lost, you know, things... Things, it definitely changes changes it, right? Yeah, well, let me ask you what your, I mean, this is your personal uh, opinion on this or thoughts on this, but what is lost? So if this language you're studying and if it wasn't being documented at all hmm. and it were to disappear in the next generation or so, I mean, what to you is lost in that? That's well, a value for, I mean, for people that are outside, it's like, who cares? You know, I speak yeah. English, everybody else speaks English, everybody yeah. speaks Portuguese here, whatever. What's yeah. lost? What's lost in that process? For one, there's this kind of process of cultural continuity and transmission that's been going on for millennia, right? Uh, these people, they've been in this as far as they know, right? And when uh, they stop speaking their language, a certain, uh, certain aspects of that's going get, to get, uh, not going to get transmitted anymore, mm-hmm. right? So that's the kind of the... What ends up losing is the continuity of a people over thousands of years, right? That's a big, that's a big thing. And with that, all the, other, all the other parts, all these people's... Uh, way of thinking and observing and discussing and interpreting the world around them, right? And that's mm-hmm. that's like some like this evolutionary socio evolutionary experience or experiment in this one location with this one set of surroundings with a certain set of outcomes, and you're just kind of a, a, a cementing over that whole you know that whole uh, whole ecosystem of of uh, social of language and culture and history that that has been growing there for like a thousand years, you know. Yeah. Does that make sense? If yeah, the absolutely. Metaphor is not a... Yeah. No, that's perfect. That's exactly what it is, right? Yeah, and and I'm sure that there's things in that language that... Like, it's like when, you know, I'm just being here in Brazil and 
you know, will translate something for me from someone says around me and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, you know? And then she's like, well, I don't know how to really even translate that word yeah. into English. And that's like, that's a dominant language. And then another dominant language, English. And they, sure. even then there's like things lost in that translation. Yeah. I'm sure that with... There's so much. There's so much interesting things. Like, even like from a... Without getting into like the kind of uh, interactional aspects of like the pragmatics of everything like even the grammar is so different that things like just the way you can express things are so different like in the language they have two pronouns for we mm. so you could say we are going to the store and i could i could say that i could say patrick we're going to the store that means me and me are going to the store mm-hmm. right and you're staying mm-hmm. or i could say patrick we're going to the store all three of us right and you'd use two different pronouns mm. one is uh well yeah one is urit and one is wari. So, like, you would use two different pronouns depending if it's all of us or if it's us but not you. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just, like, a little thing. And, like, in English, if you say to somebody, oh, we're going to the store, the hearer of the, of the utterance is unsure whether they're invited or not, right? So you rely <laughs> on this, like, kind of social pragmatics of interaction to realize if you're invited or not, right? Or I could say, Patrick, uh, we're going to a party later. Mm. Did I invite you to the party or not, right? It's, it's ambiguous. Right. Whereas in this language, it's not ambiguous at all because there's two pronouns. It's as different as saying we and they, mm. right? It's like who's included, who's not included. It's like that's just like a grammar thing that like actually really affects how you interact with people. And, you yeah, know, yeah, sure. and there's, you know, hundreds of examples of these of like the structure of individual languages and how they interact, right?